welcome uh, to this uh, October Klein Cafe uh, on uh, tax and data mining exceptions in the new directive on copyright in the digital single market. This is um, uh, the first cafe of the fall series uh, uh, after the summer break and uh, uh, the Clarin conference. So it's uh, good to go back to the normal activities. Uh, so what is a Clarin Cafe? Clarin Cafe is a, a new informal uh, virtual space to discuss topics that are of relevance for the Clarin infrastructure. And this is definitely uh, one such topic. Um, oops. Uh, the organizer of today's cafe uh, are from the uh, Clarin Legal and Ethical Issues Committee, the CLIC. Uh, they're Pavel Kamotsky and Vanessa Hannes Schlager, who uh, were here, uh, were chatting here before uh, I started. And I am your host for today uh, from Clarin Eric. I'm Francesca Frontini, and I'm part of the Clarin Eric Board of Directors. So uh, just a few uh, words about uh, the program. Uh, I will give a brief uh, uh, introduction uh, to those of you who are, maybe are new to the Clarin infrastructure. Those who know about the Clarin infrastructure can take this time to go and grab their uh, cup of coffee. <laughs> and, uh, and then we will we'll move on to the, uh, to the real cafe. Uh, just an, an announcement, uh, Professor Alexei Kelly, uh, who uh, was supposed to be one of the speakers could not be here today for uh, personal uh, reasons. And uh, so his um, part will be uh, taken care of by, by Pavel and uh, also in part uh, for what concerns Austria by uh, Walter Schögler. So just a, a quick announcement, this event is recorded for dissemination purposes. You have been asked for your uh, consent to, to this recording. If you do not want to be recorded, please keep your uh, camera uh, switched off. And uh, when you're not speaking, also your microphone. For questions and comments, there would be also um, a discussion, uh, but uh, a time for discussion. But in the meantime, you can put your uh, comments in the chat. So just a, a few words about, uh, about Clarin Eric. Clarin stands for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. It is uh, an Eric, a European Research Infrastructure Consortium and uh, since 2012. And it is also recognized as a landmark by the S3. So it's an established infrastructure. Its uh, aim is to provide easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences and beyond to digital language data in written, spoken or, spoken or multimodal form, and advanced tools to discover, explore, exploit, annotate, analyze, or combine them wherever they are located. And in order to facilitate this, it is also put in place a system of single sign-on, an environment of single sign-on. It serves furthermore as an ecosystem uh, for knowledge sharing, and it is an integral part uh, now in the, the construction of the EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, to which it provides services. So just a few words about what uh, language resources are for those who may not know. The term uh, refers to a broad ra range of speech and language data types in machine readable form, as well as tools and services for the processing of language data. Uh, so on the one hand, you have language resources can be things such as written and spoken corpora, lexicons, multimodal resources, grammars, terminologies, or domain-specific databases and dictionaries, ontologies, multimedia databases, etc. But following a long-standing tradition, we also include in the definition software tools for the preparation, collection, and management of such resources, for instance, corpus management tools, exploration system, OCR system, pipelines for natural language processing, speech processing systems, machine translation, environment for manual annotation and evaluation, and the like. So probably for those of you who are more on the law side of things, you will see that uh, it's probably two types of ob objects that from the legal point of view are of the very different nature. Uh, we like to use the concept of resource families. Uh, I give here uh, some examples of uh, the 
types of resource families that uh, Clarin deals with. So you have various types of corpora, lexical resources uh, and tools, as well as data types. So we have data that comes from newspaper archives, literary texts, social media data, parliamentary records, historical letters, oral history data, disciplinary libraries, institutional or ar um, archival data, broadcast archives, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, this is also mirrored by a very diverse community of users, uh, which range from digital humanists, linguists, translation uh, and uh, professionals, uh, literary scholars, historians, uh, you can read for yourself, but uh, including, and this is for, I think, important for today's topic, uh, also the industry and uh, uh, in industry and professional uh, agents. Uh, so this is a quick overview uh, of Clarin today. As, as you can see, it is a distributed infrastructure, which basically relies on a network of over 60 centers. Many of those our data centers um, and 22 uh, members uh, and three observers. So um, first and foremost, Clarin is a technical infrastructure, which uh, uh, in some sense uh, guarantees the accessibility of uh, the data uh, and resources that are uh, hosted at these various data centers. So uh, this um, the data made available and deposited and, uh, in a fair way in the various clearing depositing centers are uh, described with a set of metadata that enable their discovery via a single access point, which is the virtual language observatory, which allows for metadata ser search over all of these uh, centers. Um, on the one, on the other hand, uh, these centers also uh, offer services uh, web services for language processing and uh, analysis. And thanks to the metadata, it is possible also to um, do a matchmaking between the resources uh, hosted in the centers and these uh, services that can process them. And this is done thanks to another central service of the ERIC, which is uh, the language resources switchboard. On the other hand, Clarin is also a knowledge infrastructure. So an infrastructure that allows for the sharing and dissemination of knowledge, best practices uh, uh, relating to the production and use of language resources. So um, we have a network of knowledge centers or case centers, which uh, uh, are there um, to offer uh, their expertise on specific uh, types of uh, resources. We have a, a set of uh, uh, funding and support actions uh, that range from support for uh, small projects, uh, um, uh, mobility grants, uh, when mobility is possible in real life, but also support for virtual events right now, and even recently seed grants for, uh, for, for instance, for uh, Horizon Europe projects. And uh, so we have also um, the Teaching with Clarin initiative, which has been launched recently and will be populated with uh, training materials um, uh, under the Teaching Clarin uh, banner. And of course, a part of the knowledge infrastructure is also some of the committees that uh, Clarin has in place, uh, among those, uh, the Legal and Ethical Issues Committee. Um, indeed, uh, the activities uh, relating to legal issues have been uh, uh, various and, uh, uh, and, uh, and intense in the last uh, uh, year. So uh, the CLIC has already organized a first uh, cafe in March on the rights of data subjects. And by the way, uh, these, these events are all recorded, so you can uh, go back to them uh, as you, as you uh, want. Then uh, I, I should say that uh, overall five papers were presented at the Clarin Conference in two se sessions on uh, legal issues. And, uh, um, and uh, then a panel also uh, on uh, corpora for the study of uh, language use and mental health conditions triggered uh, interesting discussions also on legal eth and ethical considerations. So there was a strong uh, focus on this aspect of the current conference. And uh, uh, as recently as yesterday, 
uh, another event, uh, Clarion sponsored event, Data Management Warfare uh, Computer Mediated Communication Corpora. So a uh, presentation by uh, Dr. Pavel Kamochki, who will be speaking soon to us as well. So uh, I think that uh, uh, I can uh, conclude now this introduction. I think I see that we have reached uh, the number of 26 uh, connected uh, participants. Uh, and uh, then I stop sharing and hand the word to, uh, first of all, uh, Vanessa, who will introduce uh, the CLIC and then Pavel. Thank you very much, Francesca. And uh, also uh, thank all of you, all of our participants for being here today. Um, I am very happy to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Clarin Legal and Ethical Issues Committee, formerly called only the Clarin Legal Issues Committee, um, and recently renamed um, about the time when uh, Pavel and I were uh, lucky enough to, to uh, take over the chairman and vice chairwomanship uh, of the CLIC. So uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I am Vanessa Hanneschläger. I am the vice chair of the CLIC. And uh, um, I'm I, with a, sort of mainly affiliated with Clarin Austria. I will not go into more detail uh, with that because that is too difficult to explain. And uh, I'm vice chair to the chairmanship of Pavel Kamotsky, the chair, current chair of the Clarin Legal and Ethical Issues Committee, who you will hear much more from today. He is formally affiliated with the Institut für Deutsche Sprache, Institute for German Language in Germany. Germany and um, chairing the, the CLIC uh, in, his, in his current first term as a CLIC chair. Um, and uh, it is uh, probably uh, worth mentioning that Pavel is um, the ideal person for the job because Pavel is both a linguist and a lawyer. So that is uh, sort of the, the ideal uh, starting point. Uh, you've heard quite a, a bit about what Clarin does and uh, also uh, sort of uh, affiliated with that what the CLIC does. So Clarin is a language resource infrastructure. And um, as you uh, will uh, all be aware, language resources come with a number of, of uh, legal headaches, which is uh, what the CLIC is trying to help with. So it is uh, the CLIC's task to uh, do analyses of, of current legal issues that concern language research researchers um, and to uh, publish uh, white papers, uh, white papers and other papers uh, to organize training events uh, such as this one, educational activities, etc., uh, to support language resource researchers, specifically uh, people working with digital methods for re language resource research. Um, in, in doing their work and doing their work uh, according to, to current uh, European legislation, because uh, as Clarin is a European infrastructure, of course, um, the legislation that concerns all of us jointly is, is our main uh, point uh, or main interest. Um, we have a, a number of resources available for you uh, on on the legal information platform uh, that is also hosted on the Clarin website, uh, as well as a bibliography, etc. So if you browse the Clarin website, you can find a, a lot of, of the stuff that has already been produced by the CLIC. Um, and you've heard that we've already organized one uh, Clarin Cafe this year in the spring in March uh, on uh, data privacy issues. I posted the link to the that event in the chat. So if you're interested in taking a look at the uh, resources that came out of that, you're welcome to. And then I am uh, also uh, happy to, to uh, sort of do a quick advertisement for uh, the Clarin white paper, click white paper number three, which is sort of an introduction to all that you need to know about, uh, uh, what, about data protection for language research. research. Um, just to, to highlight that. But um, as with all digital research in, in the humanities and humanities affiliated areas, there are two uh, areas of the law that concern us a lot. One of them is data privacy and the other one is copyright, a topic uh, that we have not been focusing all that much on 
on uh, in the recent times when when the the GDPR came into place. But now uh, the copyright directive has finally been uh, implemented, and now we're back to copyright topics. And this is why uh, you are all here today. And before I hand it over to our speakers, uh, let me give you a quick introduction to them. So I already mentioned. Uh, where Pavel is, how Pavel is affiliated and uh, where Pavel comes from. Um, let me also introduce uh, Jan Hayic. I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's a professor of computational linguistics um, and he is with the Charles University of Prague. So uh, we are going to hear about the Czech perspective uh, from him today. And then unfortunately, as you have already heard, Alexei Kelly, uh, could uh, our former CLIC chair and uh, um, uh, also uh, IP professor at the University of Tartu in Estonia uh, could unfortunately not join us. Um, but very uh, gratefully, uh, not only Pavel will, will fill in the part that Alexei um, was planning to talk about, but also uh, very spontaneously our CLIC member and very esteemed colleague uh, Walter Scholger from Austria has uh, agreed to join us and to uh, give us a quick uh, introduction and a, a short input on the situation in Austria. Um, Walter is not only um, historian and CLIC member, he's also uh, one of the co-chairs of the, um, let's say, sister working group of the CLIC um, within Daria, the sister infrastructure of Clarin, if I, if I uh, may take the liberty of calling it that. Uh, so Walter is uh, one of the co-chairs of the ethics and legality working group within Daria. Um, which is where uh, Pavel and I also work closely together with him, which is always a great pleasure. And we're very grateful that he um, decided to, to help us uh, with a quick input on the stage uh, on such short notice. Um, and with that, uh, let me hand it over to our speakers. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, for this kind introduction. Let me just add to what you just said, uh, um, there will be spontaneous interventions, not only from Walter Scholger, but also from other colleagues uh, from uh, National Consortia. Um, other speakers uh, include our uh, new friend, uh, Giuseppe Versace from uh, the University of Siena in Italy, uh, as, as well as our friend Matea from um, Slovenia. But that's in the second part of, um, of uh, today's cafe. Uh, the first, in, in the first presentation, I will uh, tell you about uh, text and data mining exceptions in the um, directive on copyright in the digital single market and uh, how we got there. I'll tell you everything I know and probably much more. Um, all right. Uh, so, um, let me start at the beginning, the very beginning of copyright. It is useful to keep in mind, to, to get a broader context in which the text and data mining exceptions uh, are now um, uh, functioning. Uh, at the very beginning of, of copyright, copyright was thought of as something that should stimulate uh, the development of science and education. Uh, the very first copyright act ever, uh, the, the Statute of Anne, 1710, um, which is very much ahead of uh, Anglo-Saxon countries, the, the England and um, later the United States were very much ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to copyright legislation. So this is actually where uh, copyright uh, originated. And the very first act on copyright, the Statute of Anne, uh, the beginning of 18th century, uh, was actually called an act for the encouragement of learning. Uh, then in the US Constitution, you can read the famous copyright clause that says that the Congress has the power to uh, adopt copyright acts to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Um, and then uh, still in the 19th century, um, and, and one of my favorite uh, court cases ever, the US Supreme Court 
uh, in the case Baker against Selden, ruled uh, that, um, um, well, anyone may practice and use the art described in the book, which uh, is a foundation for what is now referred to as the idea expression dichotomy. That is, copyright does not protect the ideas, the facts uh, that are described in a book or a paper, but only the form of expression um, in, in the book. So uh, this particular case, Baker against Selden, was about the bookkeeping method. Uh, and so later, uh, someone uh, described, uh, published um, a book on this very same method using, of course, different wording, but it's the, 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 the method was essentially the same. And he was sued by the author of the original method. And the court said that, well, everyone is free to use and describe the method as uh, he sees fit because your copyright protection is only limited to the wording of your book. And I think um, it uh, is very interesting when you uh, compare this uh, early uh, American copyright case with, uh, uh, with what is happening now in Europe, especially with regards to uh, text and data mining. So it wasn't until 1970s uh, that copyright law in Europe really got interested sort of in research. Before that, uh, the two worlds, uh, copyright and intellectual property and, and, and academia uh, kind of interested, existed in splendid isolation. The first research exception, so the first uh, exception that allowed the use of copyright protected works without permission from right holders for research purposes um, actually dates back to late uh, 60s and is in the revision, one of the revisions of the Bern Convention uh, from that time. Incidentally, it is about the time when um, I think, I imagine uh, copying machines, Xerox machines, appeared in university libraries and people started, students and, and, and professors started copying textbooks. Uh, so before that, I imagine many students and, and researchers would just manually copy from textbooks uh, in their uh, personal notes. I imagine this is what people did for, for centuries. And uh, this, although it was technically an act of reproduction, was considered as well, practically irrelevant uh, for right holders. Um, and it's changed when, with the appearance of uh, copying technology. And of course, as the copying and, and sharing technology developed, um, copyright has become more and more relevant for, uh, for research. At the same time, around late 1990s, uh, the technology that is today referred to as text and data mining started emerging. So it is due to increase of computational power at the time that it has become possible to analyze unstructured data. Because before that, um, only data stored in relational databases that is really prepared for, uh, for computational analysis could be automatically analyzed. Uh, and uh, According to my best knowledge, although I have already been wrong before, so uh, take it with a grain of salt, um, the first use of the term uh, text data mining, text and data mining, or text data mining, actually comes from a seminal paper by uh, Marty uh, Hurst, um, an NLP scholar, uh, by the way. So it's uh, really a huge contribution of NLP to. Uh, text and data mining. Um, data mining, not text and data mining, but let's say it's exactly the same thing, was listed among emerging technologies that will change the world in 2001 by MIT. And the list was published at the very end of, of the year 2000. So uh, the technology is not new. It has really been around for uh, two decades now. Uh, and so it's high time. It was high time for uh, legislators to properly address it uh, in, in copyright uh, legislation. 
So around the same time when uh, data mining appeared and started gaining traction and uh, attention, uh, but was already a well-described and, and well-established uh, technology, um, the Directive on Copyright and the Information Society was uh, adopted. It was in 2001 and it was the first attempt at, uh, well, the first major attempt at harmonization of uh, copyright laws across the EU. So this um, directive that is still in force, it still, it still applies uh, very much so, still defines the main principles of copyright law in, um, in, in the European Union, is based on uh, an approach in which the, the exclusive rights of authors are defined in very, very broad terms um, for example, the right of reproduction, uh, we read that authors shall have the exclusive rights to authorize direct or indirect, temporary or permanent reproduction of their works by any means and in any form, um, which really covers everything that can be thought of as, as reproduction, as copying. And of course, with such a broad definition of reproduction, it is clear that uh, text and data mining, just like any digital use, necessarily involves reproduction. So it's a copyright relevant act. Um, because if you view a file on your screen, it means that, well, your computer is making reproductions at the very least at the memory of, of your browser. Uh, or in your in, in, in your computer's memory, even if those reproductions only last for for a, a couple of minutes when you're viewing the file and uh, deleting immediately after, there are still reproductions and they are still uh, covered by the exclusive rights of authors. It means that these reproductions can only be made if they are uh, authorized by by the right holders. And this very broad approach. Uh, was uh, counterbalanced by uh, a large catalog of optional exceptions. Um, an alternative technique uh, used, for example, in, in the United States would be to introduce an open norm that would counterbalance the rights of, of authors. So when you think about it, in our European approach, the rights of authors are an endless ocean and um, uh, uh, copyright exceptions are tiny islands of freedom. And since they are exceptions, they have to be narrowly defined. So they are constantly getting smaller and smaller, smaller. Whereas an alternative approach would be to introduce a, a continent that would border this ocean uh, with not so clearly defined borders, but um, something that would really uh, provide uh, a healthy counterbalance to those very broad uh, rights of authors. But this is not the, op the, the option that was chosen by the European legislators. We have these very broad rights and tiny, uh, very specific exceptions, many of them, uh, that's, that's for sure, but still, um, very narrowly defined. One of these ex exceptions is the, the research exception. It is optional, which means that member states may provide such an exceptions in their national laws, but they're not obliged to. And uh, it essentially, uh, it, it is only limited to non-commercial scientific research. It covers both reproduction and communication to the public. Uh, and it requires uh, attribution of, of the source. And it looks good, although in practice, this exception was transposed in national member states in a very, very narrow way. Typically, only parts of works can be used and they can only be shared with directly interested audience. Uh, sometimes this audience is, is, is limited as well. So this exception, was not satisfying for text and data mining, mostly because it only allowed for a limited amount of works and, and limited parts of works to be reproduced, which is of course not interesting for uh, text and data mining. 
if you add to this the Court of Justice of the European Union's tendency to enlarge the scope of copyright, for example, in the landmark Infopack case, in which it was ruled that uh, excerpts as short as 11 consecutive words, so 11 grams, um, can be covered by copyright. Well, you quickly realize that a reform was needed to allow uh, text and data mining to develop its full potential in Europe. Um, so 20 human years have passed since uh, the adoption of the 2001 InfoSoc Directive, and this is uh, what happened in 2012 already. The European Commission announced its um, intention to review the InfoSoc Directive, review copyright law in the European Union. In 2013, uh, a stakeholder dialogue entitled Licenses for Europe uh, take place where, and there was a group, a specific working group on text and data mining in which Claren participated. Um, and it was a stakeholder dialogue. So uh, publishers on one hand and researchers of various, various other stakeholders on the other were supposed to sit around the table and agree on uh, licensing solutions. So license templates for text and data mining and other uh, burning issues in, in copyright law at the time. And at least the text and data mining part was a complete failure because the, re the representatives of research organizations, the researchers withdrew from the process uh, saying that, well, we don't agree uh, with licensing for text and data mining. We don't need, we don't want licenses for mining. We want the right to read uh, we, we want the right to mine. And so they were uh, arguing that the right to read should be equal to the rights to mine. If you have access to something, you can read content, then uh, you can mine it as well, because it's fundamentally not very different from human reading. It's just uh, much faster and um, much more efficient when it comes to extraction of certain kinds of information. Uh, in 2013 and 14, there was a public consultation on copyright reform in which Claren took place as well, took uh, part as well. Uh, so uh, I guess the, at least in, in, in a tiny part, the DSM directive is um, uh, um, something that Claren has contributed to. Uh, meanwhile, national legislators in some countries were tired of waiting and so decided they, they decided to adopt uh, national exceptions in their national laws without waiting for a European intervention. And uh, these countries included the UK, which uh, adopted a text and data mining exception in 2014. And this exception, all these exceptions were based on the InfoSoc directive. That is, they were only for non-commercial research because that was the only kind of research exception that was allowed by the InfoSoc directive. So um, we had uh, an exception in 2014 in the UK, uh, which required lawful access as a condition for text and data mining. And we'll tell more about it because this requirement is now present in the directive. It didn't allow any sharing of the copies made in the process. So the corpora built in the process of text and data mining and the UK exception um, overridden, uh, overrid uh, contracts. So contracts were overridden by the UK exception, <coughs> which is a very interesting feature, which is also present in the current uh, wording in the DSM directive. So this UK exception has very much influenced uh, the, the uh, directive on copyright in the digital single market. Uh, in 2016, we had an attempt, a failed attempt, uh, I will say, um, to adopt a uh, text and data mining exception in France. Uh, why failed? Because the exception um, in the law uh, was very broad and it left um, many issues to be um, decided by um, uh, an application decree, so by the government. And 
no application decree has ever been adopted, which means that it's it's totally a dead letter. Uh, the, the current uh, text and data mining exception in France, the, the, the one adopted in 2016, uh, it doesn't, it has no practical application whatsoever. Uh, Germany in 2017 adopted a very interesting uh, exception for text and data mining for non-commercial research purpose uh, purposes. Uh, it uh, had basically the same uh, similar features as the UK one in which it, uh, as much as it uh, uh, overrid uh, contracts, uh, but to add to this, um, it allowed sharing for joint research uh, purposes uh, or verification of results, um, which is, uh, of course, a very desirable feature from our point of view. However, it also had some downsides and undoubtedly a downside of this exception was that at the end of the project, uh, copies, that is the corpus, uh, had to be deleted or transferred to an archive for permanent storage and fair compensation had to be paid to a collecting society. So the exception was not free uh, as in as in free beer, uh, you had to pay uh, to be able to, uh, to um, mine content. Uh, not a lot of money, but still some. Um, meanwhile, in other uh, countries, um, TDM exceptions or TDM thrived as, as an activity under copyright laws. Um, in the US, it has been ruled quite clearly that text and data mining, even for commercial purposes, even for other purposes than research, is uh, covered by fair use. And this is especially confirmed in the Google Books case that was finally decided after many years in 2015. And uh, key elements in text and data mining being fair use is that it is highly transformative, so it provides a lot of added value, and it does not harm the market value of the source material. The fact that you mine, that you use books for text and data mining does, it, does not uh, harm the market value of these books. So the authors can still, the publishers and the authors can still sell those books and make profit. Um, what was important in this regard uh, was that um, Google Books only allowed for limited public sharing of, of the results. And actually, what's interesting, uh, Google lawyers even managed to uh, sell the argument um, that actually Google Books increased the value of the books that were featured in Google Books because it, uh, it uh, made those books more findable. It provided for links to Amazon, for example, where the books can be bought. And so uh, they provided convincing uh, data to argue that uh, they not only didn't harm the value of the books, but they increased the market value of the books uh, featured in, in Google Books. Uh, Japan has done an interesting uh, way uh, and it's, it covered, uh, it adopted a flexible exemption, an open norm for non-enjoyment purposes. So uses in which the work is not enjoyed by a human being, but used for, for other purposes, for example, to extract information. Uh, and text and data mining is very much a non-enjoyment purpose in, in that sense. Uh, so uh, Europe's answer, to all this was uh, the, the directive on copyright in the digital single market. The first draft was published in September 2016, together with an impact assessment. Um, impact assessment uh, in, in the impact assessment, the, the commission identified four ways to deal with the text and data mining problems uh, problem and. Uh, as it seems, finally, it opted for those options that are that were most favorable for researchers and least favorable for publishers and right holders. At least, this is what 
one might believe just by reading the, the impact assessment. So uh, it can be considered as a win for the research community. Uh, but is it really the case? Well, we will see. Um, the, logistical, the legislative process lasted until April 2019. Uh, there was really a lot, a lot of controversies, mostly about other provisions than text and data mining exceptions. Um, there were so many controversies about some provisions that I would even say that text and data mining exceptions uh, passed relatively unnoticed in the whole debate, um, despite the fact that they are hugely important for the future of copyright and research in, in Europe. The directive was published uh, and entered into force upon publication uh, in June 2019, and the member states had two years for transpositions. So the deadline for transposition was actually 7 June 2020. 21, June 7. Um, uh, right, so let's start by having a look at the definition of text and data mining in the DSM directive. Uh, I remember I once talked to a um, uh, machine translation expert, and it was um, 2017 or something like that. Uh, the, the, the DSM directive was not yet adopted, but it was um, under, under negotiation. So I told him, well, good for you. It seems like there will be a, an exception uh, for what you are doing that would give you a lot of freedom and, and what you're doing. And he was like, no, no, I don't do text and data mining. Uh, I do machine translation and that's different. Uh, I was like, no, you absolutely do text and data mining. And he was like, no, I don't do text and data mining. And um, no matter how you as a researcher or as a scholar define text and data mining, uh, for the purposes of the directive, text and data mining is defined very, very broadly. So whatever NLP you are doing, uh, you are covered by uh, the definition of text and data mining. It's any automated analytical technique aimed at analyzing text and data in digital form in order to generate information which includes, but is not limited to patterns, trends, and correlations. Almost the definition of natural language processing, corpus, well, corpus linguistics, right? Um, um, on a side note, the German exception from 2017 contains some wording that specifically referred to uh, natural language processing terminology. For example, it contained the word corpus to refer to the copies made in the process. So it was really about building corpora um, uh, and similar. So, but it, it was really something that clearly addressed the needs of uh, the NLP community, our community. We have two exceptions for text and data mining in the DSM directive, article three, which is an exception for um, text and data mining for scientific research purposes, and a general exception that is for all sorts of text and data mining uh, in Article 4. So let's start with Article 3, uh, text and data mining for scientific research. This exception is mandatory, which is indicated by the wording member states shall provide, which means that, um, unlike the research exception under the InfoSoc directive that was optional, well, member states had no choice but to transpose this directive uh, and uh, they cannot narrow it down because if it were an optional um, um, exception, then the member states could not transpose or transpose just a little bit, right? Just, uh, just very, very narrowly. Um, but this is a mandatory exception. So uh, there is no narrowing down uh, and there is no uh, way to avoid uh, transposition. Um, now, who are the beneficiaries of this, of, these, uh, of this exception? And by beneficiaries, I mean the institutions and uh, the, the legal or natural persons that can uh, perform certain acts without permission from the right holder, because this is what a copyright exception is about. So who are the beneficiaries? So the beneficiaries are twofold, two categories of beneficiaries, research organizations, 
And the definition of a research organization is quite long. Uh, and I think that it is to cover um, uh, perhaps uh, accommodate for the specificity of research in some countries where universities are mostly private. Uh, but in any case, it's clear that universities, classic continental European public university uh, is covered by the TDM exception and so are research institutions and their library. As long as they carry out research uh, on a non-profit basis or reinvest their profits in research, or uh, they follow a public interest mission recognized by the state, and this recognition can be done, for example, through um, funding, through public funding. Um, well, um, yes, I, I haven't come across uh, a scenario in which something commonly regarded as a research institution uh, would be, or a university would be outside the scope of the exception. That is just to be uh, frank and honest with you. That's the, that's the full definition. Public-private partnerships are expressly covered. So if a university is in a public-private partnership with uh, an institution from the private sector, um, then they can still use the exception in, in this uh, public-private research. Um, there is an exclusion for institutions controlled by commercial undertakings. Uh, and the way I make sense of it is that, uh, for example, if you have uh, a large company like, um, I don't know, Airbus, and uh, they have their own research institution. And so Airbus is a commercial undertaking and they have their own research institute. Uh, that performs research, but Airbus has preferential access to their outcomes, to their results, such institutions are not uh, covered by, by this exception. Uh, so uh, it is quite complex in theory, may uh, take some effort to untangle it in practice, but most of us, I think, come from good old universities and research institutions, so I think we are good. Uh, we don't really have to worry about this, this definition of a research organization. Uh, our institutions are mostly covered by, um, if not completely covered by the TDM exception. The second category of beneficiaries of this TDM exception are cultural heritage institutions, which are uh, defined as publicly accessible libraries and museums, as well as archives and film and audio heritage institutions. So these are the, 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 the types of institutions that can benefit from the text and data mining uh, exceptions. Now, what are the permitted acts? So we know the who, now the what, what can be done under this exception. So the exception allows for reproductions of copyright protected works and subject matter protected by related rights. And these related rights, depend, they depend very much on uh, the jurisdiction you are in, so the, the, the member state that you are in, but you will find uh, related rights, for example, for scientific and critical editions, regardless of their originality. So scientific and critical editions of public domain works, for example, can be covered by uh, a, a specific uh, related right, not by copyright, but an, or a, a related right. Uh, and um, this exception covers copyright as well as related rights, but only um, uh, when it comes to reproduction. So at least read uh, strictly, it does not allow for any sharing, any form of communication to the public. And uh, interestingly enough, software seems to be excluded from this exception from Article 3. Why? Because uh, software is covered by a special directive. The legal protection of software is covered by a special directive in the European Union. And this directive is expressly mentioned in Article 4 in the general text and data mining exception, but not in Article 3. So that would mean that, uh, strange as it may seem, 
software that is only the code, uh, the code cannot be used for text and data mining under uh, this exception from Article 3, for scientific reason. Uh, now, what are the permitted purposes of the uses? It's only scientific research. So even if you are in an institution that is a beneficiary of the exception, even if you are at the university and you want to perform text and data mining for other purposes, than scientific research, then you cannot. It's only for scientific research. If you want to provide, uh, to perform text and data mining of student essays for uh, plagiarism detection, for example, that is not scientific research. And this is not covered by the exception. It's only about um, research and not any other activities. There is the requirement of lawful access to the source material. Uh, Content can be mined under this exception only if the institution has lawful access to it. Now, what is lawful access? Uh, the recitals of the directive provide some guidance, and I think it's fairly clear. So lawful access is, is access that is based on subscription over license or on free availability online. So if, uh, you have the right, or actually your institution has the right to read something, then you have the right to mine it. Uh, so either it's because something is freely available on the internet or because it's available on the internet under a license. Or so typically now you have licenses for all sorts of content. For YouTube content, you have a license. Yes, the YouTube gives you a license in their terms of service. So YouTube content, for example, is license-based, but it's lawful access because you can lawfully view it. Or content that is subscription-based, so uh, uh, a scientific database from a scientific publisher, your university-based subscription, uh, you have lawful access, or actually your institution has lawful access, and you can mine uh, the content. So this is a true embodiment of the right to read is the right to mind principle, or at least it seems so. Uh, now, one can wonder if it isn't redundant because the, the, the requirement of local access, because uh, actually the Court of Justice of the European Union ruled in 2014 uh, that lawful access is, a, well, the, this is how I interpreted it at the time, that lawful access is a prerequisite for any uh, copyright exception. In 2014, in the ACI Adam case, it was ruled that private, private copies can only be made from lawful uh, sources. So perhaps it is redundant, uh, but the requirement is clearly there to, uh, 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 let me use the word silence uh, the publishers. Because publishers would be afraid that now everyone can break into their databases and just mine their content. Um, well, that's not the case. Uh, they still have, institutions still have to pay a subscription to have lawful access and be able to use the content for text and data mining. Note that the access, this is my reading at, at least, that the access it is really the institution that needs access and not an individual researcher. So if an, as an individual researcher, if you buy an ebook from Amazon, you have a license, uh, it doesn't mean that you can mine it because it really has to be bought by your institution, by your library, for example. You really have, you really need lawful access to the content via your institution. Still, there is article four uh, for you if, for the content that you own privately, so to say, and not via an institution. What about the copies? Remember the German exception uh, required the copies to be deleted after, uh, after uh, text and data mining. Uh, this exception in the, um, in the directive allows for copies, that is the corpora actually we are talking about, to be stored with appropriate level of security that involves at the very least protection against unauthorized access so that it cannot be, imagine you have a corpus of scientific uh, articles. Uh, well, you have to 
as an institution, you have to take some steps to make sure that it's not made available publicly online so that everyone, rather than buying the article from the publisher, can just download it from your online corpus. Uh, okay, this is what is meant by uh, appropriate level of security protection against unauthorized access that could harm the market value of, of, of the content. The copies don't have to be deleted uh, after the end of text and data mining, the end of the project, but they can be retained for research purposes, including for verification, which is of course a very desir desirable feature and a very good uh, development. Uh, from our perspective. Uh, perspective. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, right holders, that is publishers uh, typically, can apply proportionate measures to ensure the security and integrity of their networks and databases. So typically you are a scientific publisher, uh, you are afraid that now uh, everyone will start scraping your database uh, and your servers will not be able to withstand the, the traffic. To, to, uh, so uh, your servers will crash and no one will be able to access your database. So we will not earn money from uh, subscriptions. So right holders are allowed to adopt proportionate measures. We don't exactly know what those proportionate measures are. For example, a limit of uh, the number of articles that can be downloaded per minute, per, per account and per minute, for example, uh, to protect the security and integrity of their networks and databases. Now, both these requirements, both the secure storage of copies and proportionate measures that right holders can implement are actually quite unclear. It's not quite you know, obvious what, what is meant by that. So member states should encourage stakeholders, that is researchers and uh, publishers to agree, sit around the table, discuss and agree on best practices on both these aspects. So how the copies should be stored, how corpora made with this exception should be stored. This is of huge importance for Clarin. And what are the proportionate measures that right holders can adopt to limit text and data mining but only to ensure the security and integrity of their network and databases. All right, so uh, there will probably be uh, stakeholder dialogues, public consultations on the subject, so stay tuned. This will be regulated at the national level and not at the EU level. Okay, so stay tuned for that. Uh, this may be uh, crucial for, for our work and, and plan. Now let me move to Article 4 which is the general text and data mining exception, not for research purposes only, but for everyone really. It's also a mandatory exception. Everyone can benefit, no matter if you're a researcher, a private company, uh, a public undertaking, it's for everyone. The scope of permitted acts is exactly the same, almost exactly the same as in Article 3 with one difference. Uh, this time software is included. That is, under Article 4, you can mine code, but you cannot as a research organization under Article 3. What are the allowed purposes? Text and data mining, for any purpose. It can be research, it can be uh, for commercial purposes, so market research, for example, or, uh, I don't know, extracting information about your potential clients, defining the, the, the client base for, for your company. Um, so far, so good. Huh? So, sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, there is the requirement of lawful access, which is exactly the same requirement that I have discussed before in Article 3. But uh, there is one important condition. The right holders can opt out from uh, this exception. So the right to mine, so to say, can be expressly restricted by right holders in an appropriate manner. Uh, so uh, for what's this appropriate manner? The directive says that for, for online content, this should be done by machine readable means, for example, via robots TXT. So if you are, uh, if you are a right holder, you have a database uh, or you have a, a website simply, then all you have to do is to implement this little 
uh, robots.txt file that says, uh, I don't really know what it says because I'm not a computer guy, but uh, there is a way in this little robots.txt file to insert a line that would prevent uh, crawlers from crawling uh, the, the website. Uh, and this is enough uh, to actually opt out from this general permission uh, to text and data mining. So it's not very solid, you see. Uh, it's not really much effort that is needed from right holders to opt out. So uh, it looks like a very broad exception for text and data mining, but this is entirely on the mercy uh, of uh, right holders. Um, another important uh, caveat in this exception is that uh, the corpora uh, can only be retained for um, as long as necessary for text and data mining purposes, and they have to be deleted afterwards. Uh, now, it's not entirely clear what it means as long as necessary for text and data mining. Does it include uh, verification of results? Well, that's, uh, that's not clear. That's, uh, my reading is that it, that it doesn't. It only covers the text and data mining stricto sensu, so the process of deriving a result. And so once you have a result, you have to delete uh, the underlying corpus uh, that you use to, to train your algorithms, for example, which is a very bad idea for all sorts of artificial intelligence applications because, well, then you have no access to data that were used to train the algorithms, which leads to a phenomenon of uh, I think it's called AI black box. So you, you know there is an algorithm, but you don't really know how it functions and you cannot recreate it, you cannot retrain it because you don't have the exact same data set because this exact, this, this exact data set had to be deleted. Um, all right, so this is uh, article four. There are some common provisions about both article three and four. Uh, so you probably know that the general rule is that contracts override copyright exceptions. So imagine you have a copyright exception that allows you to uh, use content for research purposes, but you access content uh, based on the license. You sign the license with the publisher and this license expressly says, this content cannot be used for research purposes. In that case, normally the contract prevails. So the contract can deprive you of the benefits of uh, copyright exceptions in general. But uh, both the TDM, ex TDM exceptions are actually overridden, I'm sorry, they overwrite contracts. So they prevail over contracts. If, you, uh, if your institution subscribe to, um, to a database um, and the conditions of subscription say, no text and data mining allowed, then you say, ha ha, this uh, clause is null and void because uh, it, it's inapplicable uh, because uh, I'm allowed to do, perform text and data mining by a statutory exception and this exception overrides this clause, right? So it's uh, kind of a rock, paper, scissors uh, game and uh, in this case, uh, copyright exceptions prevail, which is a very desirable feature because most internet content is accessed based on a contract, some sort of terms of service that include a, 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 a license. So without this feature, it will be very easy to uh, just completely uh, um, deprive the beneficiaries of any benefits of, of the exception. However, note that Article 4, this general exception for text and data mining, can already be easily overridden by appropriate measures, which probably include contracts. So uh, unless perhaps in online environment, uh, a contract is not an appropriate measure because who reads terms of service? Well, uh, <clears throat> so, um, it's really a bit of a gray zone concerning Article 4, but Article 3 uh, totally overrides uh, contracts, which is 
very good price. Uh, both these exceptions uh, can overwrite technological protection measures, uh, which means that if uh, you are a research institution, you can mine content that you have lawful access to, you try to mine, and then boom, there is a technological protection measures that does not allow you to mine. Typically on CDs or DVDs, you would have those uh, um, blocking mechanism, mechanisms that would prevent the content from being copied. Uh, well, you can override it with the TDM exception, although the mechanism for overriding uh, technological protection measures is quite, um, well, troublesome to say the least, and it's very rarely used in practice. Uh, so I guess in practice, people just circumvent technological protection measures and they don't say anything to anyone and they hope that things will be fine and they usually are. So uh, the whole legal protection of technological protection measures uh, in Europe is a bit of a failure because you know that there is a general principle that says that um, technological protection measures that protect uh, copyright protected material cannot be overridden. Overriding technology, technological, circumventing technological protection measures is actually an act of copyright infringement. Pavel, uh, may I chime in here and yes, remind you of do. the time because we are already yes. 40 minutes over the time. <laughs> yes. But, so uh, uh, let me... I, uh, Yes, uh, let me ask you to uh, to be a little more speedy in the second part so that we... Oh, yes, the second part still, is very speedy. Please don't Yeah, worry. so that we can I, get uh, to Jan's this, part in time. May I just, uh, before we continue, uh, point you to two questions that we had from our audience on this first part mm -hmm. uh, that yes, we had in the chat. I don't see the, the chat here. Really. Uh, no problem. I will read the questions to you. So the first one uh, was all asked by Paul, and he's asking, mm -hmm. uh, given the word automated um, that you used uh, or uh, that you had on slide 24, mm -hmm. um, does this include or exclude manual analysis and annotation that might be undertaken in NLP and specifically corpus linguistics? So um, that is probably a, a question of, of the processing mm -hmm. after, after collection more generally. And let me also mm -hmm. uh, give you the second question right away, which comes from Toby, who's asking if text and data in digital form includes photographs. So that's also an interesting question of what formats are, are is there, is there any sort of reference to data formats or, or how do we, how do we have to read this? Uh, so the, First question, is manual analysis covered by uh, text and data mining exceptions? No, it's only for automatic analysis. But manual analysis can be covered by uh, other exceptions for, for research. So it's, well, it's, it's, it's a different situation entirely. Uh, text and data mining is only for automatic analysis of digital uh, content. A good question is, um, does this digital content have to be born digital or can you digitize it? Which perhaps partially also will answer your question, which is perhaps relevant for your question, I, I, I hope. Uh, can you digitize, manually digitize content and uh, then mine it automatically under this exception? Um, I hope yes. Although this is a little bit of a gray area that will be addressed in uh, the second, second part of, of my presentation. But I hope yes. Uh, and the second question, does text and data mining uh, include photographs? Yes, by all means. The form of the, the format of the data is, is relevant. You can mine video, you can mine audio, you can mine text, you can mine uh, images. Uh, anything really. It doesn't seem that you can mine uh, software, in a sense, code, uh, which is a bummer, uh, but um, yeah, it seems to be under Article 3, you cannot do it, but you st still can do it under Article 4. That is, you can do it unless it is expressly restricted by right holders by appropriate means. Okay. 
so I hope it answers your questions just a little bit. And now we'll move on to the presentation that was initially supposed to be given by Alexi, uh, but I uh, will fill in for him because he cannot join us today. And I'll be very brief on this part, so don't, don't worry uh, about the time. So uh, transposition of EU directives. Why do we have to transpose directives or do we really have to transpose directives? And what happens if, if a member state doesn't transpose a directive? So um, a directive is defined in Article 288 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union as uh, a legal act of the European Union uh, that is binding as to the result to be achieved, but the member states are given freedom when it comes to the choice of form and methods uh, to achieve it. This is different from a regulation like the GDPR. The GDPR is a regulation and it applies directly in the member states. It doesn't require transposition. Uh, but a directive has to be transposed uh, in order to achieve the binding effect, so to say, the binding result. Uh, so usually a modification of national law is required. Uh, the European Commission may sue a member state and the Court of Justice of the European Union for non-transposition or for inadequate transposition. Uh, all those countries who haven't transposed it yet and is, we are past the deadlines theoretically can be sued for a non-transposition or inadequate transposition, although it obviously will not happen because of the context and the pandemics that happened between the, 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 the entry of the directive into force in 2019 and, and, and today. So, uh, plus it is not uncommon that member states uh, have uh, experienced delays in transposing directives. So don't worry for your member state if it hasn't yet transposed the directive. Um, it's really not a huge deal. More interestingly, perhaps, a member state can be sued for damages by an individual who suffered a loss due to non-transposition or inadequate transposition. So if your member state, you're a researcher and your member state does not transpose uh, the directive, hasn't transposed the directive, the, the, the text and data mining exceptions, and you consider that you suffered a loss because of that, because you have to pay licenses, for example, for text and data mining, um, theoretically, you can sue the member state for non-transposition or inadequate uh, transposition uh, and get damages. Although in practice, it happens very rarely, but there is uh, such a possibility. So um, there really are ways to act against uh, a country that does not transpose uh, EU directives. So the deadline for transposition of the DSM directive was 7 June 2021. And there is a very important thing you have to note in Article 25 of the Digital Single Market Directive uh, the, that says that the member states may adopt um, or maintain broader exceptions if they are compatible with the exceptions from the previous directive, the InfoSoc Directive from 2001 for uses uh, covered uh, in, in the DSM Directive. So it is possible to combine Article 3 of the DSM directive, so the text and data mining for research with the general research exception in the InfoSec directive. And this general research exception, uh, I, I, I let me remind you, allows for reproduction and communication to the public, but only for non-commercial research purposes and with uh, attribution of the source, unless it is impossible. Now, what are the challenges in transposing uh, those TDM exceptions? Uh, there are several of them. I have tried to identify some questions that have to be answered, if not by the legislator, then uh, at least by the executive or the judiciary at some point. Um, so for example, is adaptation of source material permitted? So can you, for example, mine books can you take a book digitize it that is in your university library so you have local access to it can you digitize it and use it uh for text and data mining this is not clear why because the adaptation right is not harmonized in the european union 
So it is uh, EU law is agnostic when it comes to adaptation. Um, so it may very much depend on the member state, but I do hope that people are reasonable and they will allow uh, digitization as a form of adaptation for text and data mining, because without that, the exceptions are, don't really have uh, much sense. Also, can you modify the source material by annotating, for example? Big question. I do hope that the answer is yes, and there is quite a lot of arguments in, in favor of such an answer. Uh, I know that some uh, legislators are unhappy with the definition of text and data mining because it's so broad. So they might be tempted to use a different term than text and data mining or a different definition of text and data mining. Uh, but that might be risky because that may be inadequate transposition, which can be uh, sanctioned by the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, then can the, the output of text and data mining, for example, a translation model, a language model, be freely shared? Is it a derivative work? Well, this is probably something to be answered by, by courts, but it's a, it's a huge question. Um, is it necessary to further define local access? Uh, personally, I don't think so, but perhaps, and perhaps the courts will have a role to play. Um, also, uh, should mining of software of the code be allowed under Article 3, because it is allowed under Article 4, and Article 3 is obviously broader than Article 4, so it only makes good sense to allow for, uh, for mining of software. Um, it's not expressly allowed in the directive, but it can be inferred from sort of a theological, theo, 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 well, whatever, uh, purpose-based interpretation of, uh, of, uh, of the directive. What about those specific requirements for secure storage of copies that I mentioned? Perhaps they can be regulated by a legislator to some extent, just like the measures uh, that publishers may implement to protect their data, databases and networks. So this is a question that uh, the legislators have to answer. Well, probably this should not be answered in the law because the directive encourages a bottom-up approach. Uh, but uh, some uh, legislators might be tempted to uh, sort this question out in their transposition. Uh, under Article 3, so research for text and data mining purposes, can copies be shared for verification purposes? because they can be retained for verification purposes, but can they be shared? I think that uh, the, 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 the authors of the directive imagined that the verification will be done internally, that is someone from the same research institution, the same university will come and do the verification, which, uh, well, doesn't really make much sense and certainly know how not how good research should be done today. So it only makes sense to allow uh, for copies to be shared for verification purposes. Um, also the appropriate measures for right holders to opt out from article four, uh, that is the general text and data mining, that is uh, the, the, the measures to reserve the right to mine uh, can be more, more specifically defined in national law um, and finally, uh, what I mentioned uh, in the, the, the first part of my presentation, do we need more details uh, about the retention of copies under Article 4? Because the directive only says that the copies can be retained for as long as necessary for the purposes of text and data mining. Does it include storage for verification purposes after the result is obtained? Well, uh, let's see what... Uh, national legislators from different member states have to say. And I will uh, leave the floor to my dear friend and colleague, Walter Scholge. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about Austria? Um, yeah, um, can you hear me actually? Does it work this time yes. around? Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, so Austria is late to the party. Uh, we are not the only ones who are late to the party, but uh, it's a habit of ours. Uh, 
uh, basically not to implement on time. Uh, so there has at least been now a, a parliamentary draft uh, that was open for commenting by the community until last week, actually. Uh, so it's now under parliament revision and should actually be passed before the end of the year. Um, Apart from some other paragraphs that will be changed in the Austrian, uh, in the Austrian Copyright Act, uh, the most important addition to the, to the party will be paragraph 42H, which is called text and data mining, text and data mining, uh, actually, uh, in, even in German. Uh, and I think the, the most interesting part, I mean, the, the wording is that everyone may, on behalf of a research or cultural heritage institution, reproduce a work in order to use it, to automatically evaluate texts and data in digital form for scientific or artistic research uh, and to obtain information about patterns, uh, trends and correlations and so on. So on one hand, there is a, a little bit broader text and data mining definition than we have in the, in the original European directive. Um, there is also this distinction that Basically, any person can do that on behalf of a research or cultural heritage institution, uh, which might be a minor detail, but still an interesting one, um, because it's not um, institution focused, but individual focused, basically. Uh, lawful access, of course, is the prerequisite uh, to make use of this exception in the first place. Um, it is not necessarily just for non-commercial research, so there, there can be a commercial interest involved as long as there is public interest. So it might, for example, be a research institution um, that gets um, a state grant, an official grant, a federal grant, uh, even though they are privately organized, it is still in the public interest if they get public funding and stuff like that. So there are some some small details about, about that, but it's not strictly non-commercial. Um, the whole thing is limited to reproduction, so making available and all of these things, broadcasting and so on, is not included. Uh, however, storage is uh, justifiable by the research purpose. That's also a very, um, very interesting way of saying it, I guess. Uh, evaluation is expressly mentioned. Um, however, the way it's worded also in German in, in particular, um, I think implies that storage is only allowed for one specific research pro uh, project or specific research purpose. So you are not allowed to reuse it for some other purpose afterwards. Um, appropriate safeguards have to be in effect in order to, to allow for storage. The interesting part about that, I think, is that it's explicitly mentioned that standards and best practices agreed upon by representative associations and institutions um, are considered appropriate safeguards. So I think that basically um, groups like CLIC, groups like ELDA uh, that are representing large European research infrastructures might actually get a say in what is considered appropriate safeguards. So that's, that's I think, quite interesting. Uh, and individual use uh, is also possible. Um, again, if lawful access is given, and if there is no explicit ban on the re on reproduction, um, so Nutzungsvorbehalt in German, um, which could also be enforced through technical measures. So DRM is a problem for, for such individual uses. Um, and in the case of individual use, the storage limitation also only applies to the analysis information retrieval, but not for any longer period of time. Uh, so if you actually want to do proper research, you will have to be affiliated with a research or cultural heritage uh, institution to do it, because only then will your work also be uh, able to be evaluated. And I think that's the quick summary of the Austrian um, take on the whole directive. And I don't think, given that uh, there hasn't been that much discussion uh, going on uh, during the uh, review period, I don't think that there's, there are going to be many changes uh, regarding that particular uh, state uh, of the Austrian um, implementation. Thank you very much, Walter. And from Austria, we'll move on just across the border to Italy. And I'll leave the floor to uh, 
Giuseppe Versace from the University of Siena. Good morning to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So in my quick presentation, I am to give you some brief notes about the situation of the Italian transposition of the EU Digital Copyright Directive. In Italy, as in other member states, the directive is not implemented yet. Currently, we have a, a draft law proposed by the, the Italian government under parliament revision. So my comments are based on this draft. This act amends the Italian copyright law and in particular, the tax and data mining exceptions are laid down by articles 73 and 70 quarter. These articles are completely new in the Italian copyright law. The wording of these two provisions is quite similar, but we could say also substantially identical to the uh, wording of articles three and four of the digital copyright directive. So I won't say more, uh, something more uh, that Pavel already said. In my view, there are only two relevant, remar relevant remarks. The first one is that contractual provisions, contractual clauses in contrast with the tax and the mining exceptions for scientific research are considered void. This was not specified by the directive. Uh, we know that European legislator usually don't specif doesn't specify the consequences in terms of validity of contracts. And the second one, the second remark concerns the tax and data mining made for purposes other than scientific research. Indeed, corpora, so copies of works and other subject matter shall be stored with an appropriate level of security. So also uh, in the case of uh, text and, not, and data mining made for um, purposes other than scientific research. And this was not specified by Article 4 of the Digital Copyright Directive. So that's all for Italy. And but we have to wait the um, the the parliament revision yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Uh, and uh, from Italy, we'll move once again across the border uh, in a different direction slightly to Slovenia. And I'll leave the floor to uh, my dear friend Matea, please. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, DSM um, <clears throat> directive is not yet implemented <laughs> in Slovenia as in other countries. It is currently under parliament revision, but uh, due to many um, comments, due to many public debate, since uh, 2019, um, I actually don't think that it will be implemented soon, although we are due. Um, um, so the main problem is <clears throat> uh, whether tax and data mining is enough or it should be broader, uh, like data analysis. Uh, this was much discussed. Um, the parliament is against uh, broader uh, definition, but the research institutions, uh, institutions, especially National University Library, uh, is very, uh, very much <clears throat> for the uh, data analysis as broader uh, term. Then uh, much discussed was also respond from right holders um, of copyright. Uh, how much, how long uh, there is a response that it should take, whether researchers are allowed to process texts or not. Um, and it was suggested that it should be no longer than 72 hours and whether there is a response or not. 
uh, after 72 hours, the researchers are allowed to do <laughs> researches um, on texts. Uh, there there uh, should be no regulation on data storage because <clears throat> data storage should be um, should be allowed on, on uh, research institutions and should be not uh, prescribed or defined in law and that there should be also allowed remote access for text and data mining. This is um, quite a problem because, for instance, National Library has much text um, accessed only on their computers. So even if you are in Ljubljana and not on the, the specific address, you cannot access many texts, although they are available and um, are possible to, uh, to uh, go under TDM exception. And uh, another very much discussed and proposed and not, <laughs> uh, not very um, keen <laughs> result uh, for the parliament at least, is that the TDM results should be public, publicly released and also open. Um, and this is quite a problem. So um, I think these five points are main, um, main <laughs> quarrels uh, why the, the um, TDM was, uh, DSM is not implemented yet. So much for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matea. And now we will perform a little bit of a geographical jump and uh, we'll move to Germany, uh, which will be presented by yours truly. Uh, so Germany has actually already implemented uh, the, the directive uh, by law of May 30. One uh, 2021, which entered into force exactly on uh, the deadline for, for transposition. That's uh, German punctuality, isn't it? Um, um, and some of the interesting points, I, I think this transposition is done uh, really extremely well. Uh, and I think it deserves attention from uh, the international, I mean, European uh, audience. Um, and here are some key points about it. Um, so the TDM, the definition of text and data mining has been slightly modified. The directive uh, defines TDM as analyzing text and data in digital form. The German law, this is my translation, but it's uh, kind of word for word. Uh, not very difficult to translate this bit. Uh, it's analyzing individual or mar multiple digital or digitized works. Uh, individual or multiple, well, that's perhaps not extremely vital because, uh, well, you rarely perform TDM on just one work, although, well, someone can mine just one book, why not? Um, and uh, I don't think that it brings a lot to the definition of the directive, but what does bring a lot is the, the digital or digitized part, which clearly means that the works can be, doesn't, they don't have to be the source material used for data mining, does not have to be born digital, it can be digitized. Um, and this is reinforced, this is the last bullet point on my slide, let me jump to the last bullet point. This is. This, uh, in, this interpretation is reinforced by um, the modification in the definition of the adaptation right in the German Copyright Act, which states that solely technical modifications of source material for text and data mining are not adaptations. So they, they, are, not, uh, they are not covered by a, a, um, um, an exclusive right of the author. So such modifications can be freely done. And I believe that digitization is a technical modification uh, of uh, source materials. So is change of format, for example, uh, change of uh, text encoding, for example, would be a solely technical 
modification. Now, Article 3 uh, of the uh, DSM directive has been implemented rather creatively together with uh, the InfoSoc directive. So the two exceptions have been kind of mixed into, into one. Remember that Germany already had uh, a, a text and data mining exception for non-commercial scientific research when the directive uh, was published. So uh, Germany maintained uh, parts of their previous exception and added new elements from the DSM directive, which produced a, an interesting result. So um, interestingly, citizen scientists, that is research is not affiliated with the research organization that pursue non-commercial research only can also benefit from the exception. This is clearly from uh, the interpretation of the InfoSoc directive, not the, the DSM directive. Sharing, and this is very important for, for us, sharing of the corpora, the, the, the copies, is allowed as long as, as, as it is done with individual persons for verification. So corpora can be shared with individuals for verification purposes. So the verification does not have to be performed internally. The copies can actually leave the, uh, the institution for verification. Or um, a corpus can be shared with a limited circle of persons for joint scientific research, which I think is a huge, uh, huge for, for Claren or, or projects like, like this, or the text plus uh, infrastructure in, in Germany. However, only non-commercial institutions can share. So not all research institutions, but well, most of the institutions that are uh, involved, if not all the institutions that are involved in German Claren are covered by this non-commercial um, requirement. Um, and uh, the sharing cannot be permanent, unfortunately, but uh, sharing must end upon completion of joint research. But if there is another joint research uh, project, then, well, the sharing can start again. Um, if there is sharing, there is an obligation to mention the source, unless this is impossible. And this is also clearly from the, uh, the InfoSoc directive. So you can really see that the two exception has been mixed into one. Um, uh, the exception of article four, the general text and data mining exception has also been implemented. Uh, and uh, how it differs from the wording of the, in the directive is that it's, very explicit about the fact that uh, for online content, opting out by right holders requires machine readable form. So now opting out in terms of service, you really need this robots TXT or other machine readable uh, opt out. And the directive does not seem to be extremely categorical about this. They only quote uh, machine readable um, forms as an example of, of opt measures, uh, appropriate measures to opt out. Okay, so uh, this was a postcard from Germany, and I guess we can move on to uh, my dear friend, uh, Jan Heitsch from Charles University, Prague. Jan, the floor is yours. Okay, so can you hear me uh, if I put the microphone like this? Yes. Okay, so I, I will I will try to do a, a quick uh, uh, overview, and then I will actually say a few things from my point of view as a sort of a practitioner of uh, NLP or machine learning. Uh, what would be the, the the most crucial points that would still need clarification or possibly a change? Uh, Pavel has already mentioned, in fact, uh, most of the points that I will be making. But I will I will try. Uh, I was trying to put onto the slides. The, the, the most important pressing ones for us uh, who, who want to do research and also uh, a technology transfer uh, to, to companies. So we are sort of combining uh, two things. One is research and one is the help uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, you know, for, for, for the industry to actually use the results of our 
uh, of our research. So just to review the situation as we as we heard uh, in the in the previous presentation, so the Czech Republic has not, similarly to Slovenia, Italy, and others, uh, implemented or, or transposed the directive. It is under the um, <clears throat> it is in the hands of the Ministry of Culture. Uh, there were consultations. I was actually present in in some of them. Uh, but but the result went to the parliament in May, but uh, due to COVID and other things, and also our elections, uh, we now don't have a government. The government will be there again, uh, probably by the end of the year, if everything goes well. And then there will be a new parliament, of course, after these elections that will be called soon. Uh, but then there is a huge backlog of, of bills that are in the parliament and they will have to go through the usual uh, voting procedure. So uh, we don't have high hopes for this to be done, certainly not by the end of this year, but maybe in the first half of next year, if there is not uh, um, a, a big problem uh, elsewhere or with other laws. So until then, uh, we can only use the, the Czech uh, Copyright Act uh, from 2000 with amendments. One of them uh, that, that's, that's in force now is granting a relatively broad research exception um, and then the usual ones which every copyright act has. Uh, this research exception is good for us but, uh, but does not solve the, the crucial problems I will, I will talk about in a, in a, in a second uh, either. So uh, next slide. So, okay, so, so I, I just copied because I, I hope uh, the slides will be shared so that people can see exactly how the current uh, version, which is now sitting in the parliament, but of course can be modified by the parliament uh, looks like. And, and, uh, and this is the original in Czech, but I've also translated it on the next slide. So next slide, please. Yes, that's it. Um, so, uh, so the Ministry of Culture, in its infinite wisdom, has swapped the two paragraphs, uh, Article Three and Four. So, in the Czech law, it uh, Article Four, uh, which is Thirty Nine C, will be the first one, and then uh, we will have the research exception in the second one. Now, I, I have to say, without re even reading the whole thing, uh, that this is almost um, exactly what's in the Article Three and Four. With one, uh, with one uh, interesting exception that the legal access was not built in because the Ministry of Culture says it is in other parts of the law and the law should be taken uh, together as, as a whole. So, so we, we cannot, uh, as Pavel said, uh, probably we, we cannot copy things which we don't have legal access to anyway. Uh, so, so it is not in these two paragraphs, but it's elsewhere in the law. So, but um, there were many suggestions for changes, like broadening, broadening uh, the scope uh, based on the InfoSoc directive, but eventually none of it uh, uh, got into the government uh, uh, proposal of, of, of these two new paragraphs in the, in the Copyright Act. And then, of course, there are all the other paragraphs of the Copyright uh, Directive. So next slide, please. So... What, what, we, what we hope it will solve as uh, um, compared to the current situation when we have only this one line uh, research exception in the law is that we, we won't be, um, it, it won't be necessary to get explicit licenses if, uh, the, if, if any of the restrictions that we can find on the web or in the digitized book say something that we cannot use it. Uh, now uh, it is not overridable by contracts and we will be able to get that without asking the authors. This is very important for the large data collections or large corpora that we now have to use, for example, to build these uh, big language models like BERTS or GPT-2, GPT-3 uh, for Czech or for other languages. So this is one of the, one of the biggest uh, advancements. Uh, it will also give us uh, uh, security when we don't know the authors, like on the web, very often uh, you have things and uh, you have things which are not uh, signed um, and, uh, um, or they, they are in some archive of the internet or a snapshot of the internet and you don't know. And we do not have to really uh, go through the process of finding out whether this is really an orphaned work or not. Uh, so, so again, this will, this will be easier to do. Um, we can uh, use uh, um, uh, model language, which uh, was 
uh, more difficult. We could do it under the research exception to a certain extent, but again, uh, in some cases, uh, we, we would have to be very careful to check uh, the the conditions in terms of uh, service or terms of use on these corpora. So we now will be um, able to look at modern language. This is in Czech, this is actually an issue because the language 70 years ago or 100 years ago was, was quite different. Now, many people now uh, circumvent the copyright uh, issue by shuffling the text using this 11 word thing. Uh, but uh, but th this was good let's say five years ago and earlier when our technology was unable to use longer sequences anyway. But now when we have these uh, huge language models which are able to look at very long context, it, it is completely in, insufficient to feed it uh, with data like this. The results are simply not, not usable. So, so this is very important to, to be able to use the text as they are uh, without you know, cutting out sentences or words uh, from them. Now in industry, um, at least uh, we will be able to provide the industry in our technology transfer efforts with the algorithms, and then the industry will be able to do it themselves, uh, provided they, they use the, the Article 4 exception and sort of get the data somehow, but, but we cannot share uh, our data with them, which is unfortunate. So what will not be solved? And, 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 and now I am uh, referring to some of the things that uh, Pavel already said and which we discussed in the chat, um, that for, you know, today, we essentially cannot publish a paper if we do not include a link to freely available data uh, on which people can, uh, you know, verify the results. So, so reproduce the results of our own. And this is this is very frustrating for us when we do it with others' uh, uh, papers and results, and uh, would be frustrating for others to to look at our results. And many of the conferences today, not 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 even talking about the journals, would not even allow to publish. So so this is a big obstacle. On the other hand, I would actually argue, probably lawyers will not agree with me, but at least in our field, when anyone says verification, it is implied that it's not done by ourselves, by whoever produced the results, but by someone else. And verification done by someone else sort of implies that that person has to get hold of the data on which to verify the results. So I, I'm just wondering whether if someone does it and it really gets to a court, what the court would say um, when, when we argue like this, that uh, you know, since the, the, the copyright directive uh, used this term verification, that it must have meant uh, sharing for verification purposes. But again, I, I know this could be, uh, could, could be seen differently from the, from the legal point. The other question is the one that we actually discussed in the chat, it's the modifiability of the data. Are we entitled to add annotation as, as part uh, to, to, to the data? I mean, apparently, yes, uh, if it's automated analysis. Uh, but the manual allocation will probably have to be done um, in, a, in a, you know, in a slightly complicated way, like a standoff annotation, um, in a, a, so that we sort of are completely clear that we have not touched the original data, uh, because the question of whether we can modify uh, the the data is, is is sort of unclear, even though, you know, Pavel said that adaptation might be part of this uh, uh, process. Um, of the access uh, and, and copying process, um, again, uh, we cannot be sure. And then, of course, there is this question of the models. Again, Pavel has touched that. Uh, we don't even know if the models are covered by copyright. I mean, this is an ongoing discussion. Um, I would argue they are not. Uh, but, but, but then the question is, if we create these models based on the copyrighted material, which has some additional constraints on them, uh, can we, can we ever do it? Because obviously the intention of these additional restrictions was uh, to, to have the rights of the, of, the, of the authors of the data also on, on such models. I mean, I know that in many cases, an author cannot actually produce a model. On the other hand, if we have a completely automated procedures like hugging faces doing, and in fact, we are trying to do in our technical projects to allow people to use their own data to create a model, then an author could possibly argue that there are, there are tools out there 
where actually I can make more profit on my writing by creating a language model on my own text. And then it is not really fair use if someone else does the same. I mean, I, I mean fair use, but, but I, mean, I mean using the TDM. And then of course, it's also the question about whether we can actually sell the models or not. So for, for, the, for, the, for industry, the, the, this model question is probably number one, I, I would say. And the number two is uh, that now when we tell them, well, we can, we can give you the algorithms, but you have to re-download and reacquire all the data that we trained it on because we cannot share it with you. It's, uh, I mean, puts many of, especially the smaller companies off. So this is something that I, I guess should, should be solved as well. Now, the other thing is that many data on the web, which are already, so, which have been used already for NLP purposes, have some license attached to it. Uh, very often a Creative Commons license or something. And, but, but some of the, even the Creative Commons licenses can be ad adapted by all these uh, little suffixes like non-commercial use and non-derivative work and so on. And now the question is, does the TDM sort of overrides this um, if, if, if there is already such a condition on that. Um, I, I, I'm actually not sure. So this is also a, a, a legal question. So, so this all sort of uh, still makes it very hard for us to engage in this technology transfer, um, uh, which, uh, which would enable companies uh, in the Czech Republic, in Europe, to actually use the research results uh, in, a, in an easy way, um, and that's uh, that's certainly impractical. So next slide. Yes, um... And here is what uh, what we would like to see. Um, um, you know, the, the, these are the most pressing points. I would say the model ownership and what what model is actually from the copyright point of view and from a business point of view. What overrides what, what and what cannot be overridden in terms of terms of use, terms of service, and 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 copyright uh, clauses, and then uh, then of course the question that Pavel also mentioned the technical means, but this is less pressing. I would say it's really number three only. Uh, we would like to see added the possibility to share text. I know the German uh, transposition went in the right direction, but I think it's still not perfect. Because you know, do, do, I, what I imagine would be like a special, at least Europe-wide, if not worldwide, license for sharing data for verification purposes, and this would this would solve all these problems. It it would still be limited, so that not that we can share it completely publicly, uh, but but that we would be able to do it, and this is uh, th this is probably the uh, the um, the, the last point, even though, of course, uh, we would also like to see some compatibility. I mean, even within EU, uh, these transpositions will probably not be completely compatible, uh, but, but of course, uh, and, and it's still far from the fair use in the US. So we would still uh, be mu much more happy if we can come up with some, uh, um, you know, some additions or um, or a new directive in, in, in at least five or 10 years from now, which would be, uh, which would be even more compatible worldwide for, for international cooperation. So that's all for me. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, I will perhaps very briefly answer some of your questions. Uh, those that are easy to answer, are Creative Commons licenses overridden by uh, text and data mining exceptions. Uh, well, I'm pretty sure that they are because they are contracts and contracts are overridden by text and data mining exceptions. So if there is, for instance, an ND clause in, in a CC license, you still have lawful access to it and you can hopefully overcome this uh, ND uh, requirement with the TDM exceptions. There is, I think, quite an important remark regarding Jan's questions that deserves to be made. Uh, Jan mentioned several times the questions of sharing of data for verification purposes. Uh, and we have a partial answer in recital 15 of the directive that in this last sentence says that the use for the purposes um, of scientific research um, 
such as scientific peer, peer review and joint research should remain covered where applicable by the exception provided in the InfoSoc directive. So, so the old research exception. So that would mean verification peer review only for non-commercial research purposes, perhaps. Uh, what about, well, commercial research performed by uh, research institutes covered by the TDM exception. Uh, and that only shows us that despite this mandatory TDM exception, we still still need to uh, uh, lobby and and uh, act actively fight for um, for a broad uh, implementation, broad transposition of the previous exception, the old exception, the the, the general research exception for non-commercial uh, research and the InfoSoc directive, because this is what can allow us to share copies for verification purposes. And this is what has been done in Germany. I, I yeah, I, I agree. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the InfoSoc directive is not compulsory. So in, in you know, when, when you when you talk about uh, European uh, cooperation in research, it might be more difficult uh, uh, if some countries do not implement that, that broad research direction. But, but, but it is really crucial for research for publication because, you know, in research, publication is all that counts. And if you cannot do a publication, it will be very bad. I mean, for, for a commercial use, um, I think w it, will, it will definitely have to be revisited when the AI regulation comes into force, because in fact, the AI regulation will fall on NLP in full. As, as anything that we do in NLP by machine learning will fall under the AI regulation. And, and, uh, and of course, this is still at, in a draft version. I don't think it will be adopted as quickly as people think, but it will be adopted at some point. And one of the crucial points when someone uh, judges the double use of the technology or any harm or ethical issues will be the data. And uh, if, if a company cannot show the data, it will not be allowed to do business under the AI regulation. So that definitely will have to, you know, there, there will have to be some change in laws uh, unless the AI regulation um, will have like a higher force. I, I'm not sure how, how that can be done. Uh, but, but uh, which so, so that companies can then keep the data because they say, but we have to do it because the AI regulation, even though the TDM does not allow it, but but this does. So I don't know. I mean, how how, how this will be done eventually? Andreas, did you re-raise yes. your hand? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, no, I just uh, re-raised my hand. Yeah, because um, talking about the role of Clarin, Clarin could become one of the agencies, one of these uh, trustful uh, providers that, for instance, allow uh, data to be stored there for uh, evaluation purposes. So this could be a quite an imp important new area for our infrastructure. So this, this is the last thing I wanted to say, <laughs> but I keep keeping going back to Clarin, it's quite important for us as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that we need maybe next year, uh, another cafe on the role of Clarin <laughs> specifically, and maybe we can discuss this uh, uh, later uh, or at the beginning of next year. Okay. Meanwhile, I, as a, uh, you wait for other questions, I just wanted to announce uh, the next cafe. It's not yet on the web page, but it will be soon and it will be on uh, teaching, so a different topic. So please keep an eye on it if you're interested. Thank you very much, Francesca. Do we have any more questions, remarks? Okay, maybe if I may, uh, I, I completely agree that we should continue this discussion and maybe do a, another uh, cafe in a year or so when let's say most of the European countries will actually have the transposition in force and to see the differences and what, what that implies for the research. Because now it's sort of still in a, a little bit state of flux. Um, I mean, we will be trying uh, hard with the new parliament in the Czech Republic to influence it and, and possibly uh, change it to a more you know, a slightly broader uh, thing like in Germany, but uh, we, we are of course not sure. But once we have the final warnings, um, I, I would be very, very interested uh, you know, in how, how it will work for us uh, when, when it's in force. And based on the actual implementations, I think only then we can suggest changes um, either to the European Parliament or 
to the national parliaments and so on. Yes, well, the, the review by the commission is scheduled for 2026, I think, five years after the, so yes. yeah, so we have uh, five years. And I think the, the article says no earlier than 2026 will the European Commission publish a review. So, uh, so yes, uh, these things take an awful amount of time. And I agree that we will not s s answer all the questions in a couple of months, but in a longer perspective, there is a lot that we can do uh, for uh, greater freedom of text and data mining and NLP in, in Europe. Thank you very much. I see no further raised hands and no more issues brought up in the chat. So uh, with this, let me uh, thank all of you for uh, participating, for sticking with us. Uh, and let me thank our speakers, especially uh, for a very informative, very dense cafe. Um, Francesca and Pavel and I will be in touch to exchange all your personal uh, details um, of the of the people reg registered for this cafe so that we can be in touch to create a forum to keep this discussion going. And uh, yes, we look forward to seeing you at the next cafe on text and data mining <laughs> a follow up cafe in a year, let's say. Thank you. All booked. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone.